All right, everybody, welcome to the next video. Today we will be discussing capitalism. Capitalism. Why capitalism? Well, to answer this question, we're going to have to lay down our 21st century viewpoint and take a look at what was happening during the 16th and the 17th centuries. The reason why I say this is because, well, for me at least, it's really difficult for me to understand uh, the motive behind uh, why people did uh, did certain things if I don't see the whole picture. This That's just me, okay? I'm not talking about you. You guys are probably far more advanced than me. But for me, in my especially 20, uh, you know, comfortable 21st century lifestyle, I never have to worry about my next meal. And so for me, it's understand to, uh, or it's, it's harder for me to understand why exactly they did what they did. So we're going to take a look as to, uh, at this question of why capitalism? First, we need to take a look at the lifestyle of the average person in Europe prior to the European Economic Revolution. About 80 to 90 percent of the population was involved in working in agriculture. Some stats will go as low as 75 percent and most will hover around the 80 to 90 percent. But let's just split the difference and just go with about 85 percent. All right, so you have 85 percent of the population working on farms that were lent out by the lord of the land. Keep in mind that when you decided to become a vassal of that lord, that you were granted a nice plot of land. However, it came at a tremendous price. Sure, you were granted protection by the lord. In exchange, though, you had to work that plot of land and give a tremendous amount of the crops that you grew and the animals that were grown back to the lord. Also, if you were male, you might be enlisted in service of the lord. Not only would this contract affect you, but you were essentially giving your family away for future generations so that you could use that plot of land to generate food for yourself and for the Lord, but in return you were given that protection. Because it was mostly an agrarian society, this meant that if you could eat on a particular day, that would become a major source of insecurity for you. You would be wholly dependent on the weather for your sustenance. Good and bad weather would be the difference between starvation or the ability for you and your family to eat. Ben Hart gives some excellent insight into the economic condition of the 16th and the 17th centuries. Wages and prices were set by custom. Every service and every product had a fixed price, even if external circumstances made the prices unworkable. A drought, for example, might make it necessary for the farmer to raise his crop prices in order to turn a profit. But this notion was completely antithetical to the medieval understanding of a just social order. The result was economic havoc, food shortages, and regular famines. In addition, anyone engaged in trade was required to belong to a guild, which was similar in some respects to a modern trade union, except that gaining access to a guild was all but impossible one acquired his position in this structure through inheritance. The vast majority of people were barred for, by law from entering into markets, as the force of heredity perpetuated all authority and privileged position. The guild enforced all regulations of the trade, prices, wages, and rules for workmanship, and administered punishments to transgressors. Those engaged in trade at all were lucky and few, the entire point of the guild being to protect the few market jobs that existed. The great majority of the people were marooned on a manorial plantation in indentured servitude under the authority of a lord or baron. So, as I'm sure you'd be able to quickly surmise, people were unable to move freely in a feudal economy. Who you were born to would, most of the time, seal your fate as to what your economic status would be. Thanks to the likes of guilds, you would be barred from the quote-unquote better jobs and stuck to toil in the soil and crap for the rest of your life. You would have to work the land only for the Lord to swoop in and take most of it. How much was taken was completely dependent on the Lord himself. It was all dependent on the Lord of what kind of man he would be. Would he be an understanding Lord? Would he try to understand his subjects' plights? Or would he be a crooked and corrupt Lord that would gouge you for most of what you had? If you were born to a crooked or a corrupt lord, you were screwed because it's not like you could vote him out in the next election because lords were often chosen by heritage and not by public vote. 
In this light, it's not hard to see why the Puritans wanted a new way of running their economy, and thus the desire for a free and open market was born. I will briefly touch on guilds, but let's get a little bit deeper into why guilds sucked. They basically served as a bottleneck to keep the riffraff out of the good jobs and held that 85 plus percent destitute into agricultural jobs. The very idea of new products being developed, bigger markets to be created, or better service to be delivered through cheaper or more efficient means through competition was a completely foreign concept to the English people. The guilds often served as a gatekeeper to a better market. The only way that a guild could even obtain a license to operate was by obtaining one through the lord or the lady of the land. With the license in hand, the guild would be in charge of those few precious distribution and sales jobs that would be available to them. Of course, who do you think those few precious jobs would end up going to? That's right, they would end up being kept within the friends and the family section. So if you didn't know the guild master or the guild leader, whatever you want to call him, as a close companion or a family member, you would be short on luck. No, not just for a few years, but likely for the rest of your life. You would be stuck down at the bottom of the barrel without any hope of being able to change your economic status for the rest of your life and likely for the rest of your family's life. This kind of economic system was not unique to England, but most of the old world had adopted this kind of economic system as well. Of course, you had the Catholic Church in other countries such as France, Germany, and Spain that tried to create laws against this, but most of it was to no avail. The guilds were powerful organizations that helped the monarchy and the lords gain capital, and simply getting rid of them, to the crown and to the leadership anyway, might mean financial ruin. This system meant that those at the bottom of the economic class were likely going to languish there for the rest of their lives, and those at the top would stay at the top. This type of system, as you can see, would lend itself to being automatically hereditary. So the question that the guild leaders would face was this. What man would not want to give the best to his family? What man would want to see his sons or daughters go destitute so that somebody else might have a chance to rise economically? I'm not saying that this was right. Far from it, in fact. But we can see how easy it would be to keep those few precious jobs within the family to keep your family economically on top of the rest of the pack. Thus, with this type of mentality in mind, those who were of the crown were thought to have some type of divine birthright, and those who were at the bottoms were merely peasants. Marrying up was one of the ways to get out of your economic status, but that was incredibly rare. And most of the time, the royals and those who were with power and authority would keep it within the family or marry other royals of other nations. And yes, all this inbreeding led to problems, shall we say. Eesh. Anyway, with this type of mentality in mind, when people went to the New World, they found the Indian royalty or many sons and daughters of the chiefs that they would happen upon, and they would try to marry them because their status would elevate them through marriage. Just a little fun fact, because with all the intermarriage that happened between the newly arrived Europeans and the indigenous people, there was... A lot more about it trying to elevate your status and not as much rape as, a, as many revisionist teachers are trying to push. I'm not saying that rape never happened, but it was far less common than what was thought. But that, my friends, is a, another topic for another day. Anyway, it must be said again that guilds suck. So why was the free market such a big deal? Because it allowed anyone with big ideas to profit and to advance economically in the system. Remember, the Pilgrims even tried a variation of socialism in Plymouth Bay as well as Jamestown and both times the economic system failed because people got lazy depending on others for their sustenance. There is no incentive to produce if others could do it for you and there would be no reward for you in the end of your own labor if everyone automatically had the same outcome. Feudalism only benefited the few with hereditary privilege on the top. And socialism produced weak and lazy people who became dependent on others since no one can get ahead in life and all the outcomes would be the same regardless of the amount of effort that you put into your work. The idea that a man should not eat unless he works and that he is worse than an infidel or an unbeliever came from the Bible. Now hold your stones for those of you who may not like this, but I will briefly quote the Bible to prove my point. 
In 1 Thessalonians 3.10, the Bible says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. 1 Timothy 5.8, But if any provide not for his own, especially those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Just through these two verses, we can see that the Bible makes it quite clear on God's feelings toward those who don't want to work. And you have to keep in mind that this was a predominantly Christian society that the Puritans were building in the New World. So with this in mind, the idea for everyone to work and to provide for his own family, as well as have the character that is needed to continue the work from day to day, and not only to provide, but even excel in the trade that you are engaged in, came from the Bible. The Bible is filled with scriptures that encourage hard work, work ethic, and continuous studious endeavor in your craft. From this, we can see where the spirit of Protestantism influenced the free market. The Puritans did not want to bottleneck progress like the guilds were guilty of doing back in the old world. Neither did they want anybody to be lazy. So opening up the free market to each person so they could perform according to their labor, in my opinion, was a natural progression toward capitalism. Even William Bradford recognized this early on and let every man work his own property, grow his own crops, and hunt his own food so that your progress in the new world would be directly tied to your own effort. Everyone had equality of opportunity, but not the equality of outcome. From this, we can see the start of men recognizing the importance of private property as well as the necessity of rugged individualism. From this early spirit of capitalism and the allowance of a free market, we can see the surge of the economic rise of America. Let's turn to Ben Hart one more time for a bit of insight on the early economic rise of fledgling America. There was no one in the world who could compete with the unfettered Puritan merchants a fact that can be documented by New England's astounding growth. New England's population in 1630 numbered about 1,500 settlers. By 1680, this number had increased to 68,000, and by 1710, approximately 115,000 industrious people lived in New England, which, with Boston as its trade center, had become a significant economic power. So successful were the New England industries that the British government felt forced to place draconian trade restrictions on the colonists in the form of the notorious Navigation Acts. In contrast to the asceticism of the medieval monk who would retreat to the monastery for prayer and contemplation, the New Englander believed his business, his craft, and the support of his family to be an entirely Christian enterprise. And as the great Thomas Sowell puts it, there is no other economic system in the world that has lifted so many people out of poverty. Capitalism is not perfect, but it is the best economy that the world has ever seen. Even the two leading USSR economists, Shmelev and Popov, recognized the shortcomings of socialism and communism and admitted that they had never seen anything like capitalism. China was in abject poverty until they changed their economy to a type of capitalism. And, for the final piece of evidence that I will show, is simply this. Just look at the difference between North Korea and South Korea. One is in abject poverty and the other is thriving economically that, and has lifted many of their citizens out of abject poverty that is currently experienced in North Korea by the majority, and I should say the vast majority, of their population. Just remember that communists build walls to keep people in, and those living under capitalism build walls to keep people out. But you let me know what you think down in the comments below, and I will catch you all in the next video. And don't you worry your pretty little heads, I have not forgotten to continue my series on why we should all vote for Joe Biden. So, without further ado, here is reason number three. If you're unvaccinated you have a much higher chance of getting this newly transmissible variant we had never seen before, before a couple of weeks ago. And it's the unvaccinated people who it's going to make sick. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Once again, your host has failed you. I am really trying hard not to do that. You know, not, not to fail you guys, but I don't know. It just, it just keeps happening, but I'm going to try. I don't worry. Next time I might, I might get it next time. I know. Oh yeah. Yeah. You will have a little bit of say. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll try a little bit harder next time.
Anyway, here's the real clip I was going to show you. We have this notion that somehow if you're poor, you cannot do it. Poor kids are just as bright and just as talented as white kids. P wealthy kids, black kids, Asian kids. No, I really mean it, but think how we think about it. You saw here, folks. Remember, if you're black or if you're brown, and if you're not white, then you're poor. Straight from the horse's mouth. Not mine, his. That's what he was basically saying. But I give to you reason number three. I hope you guys have a good one, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.